Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, we are so happy that you were able to join us this afternoon and this morning. I am Jatrice Martell Gator. I am a proud, dedicated vice chair of the Generations United Board of Directors. And I'm also executive vice president of external affairs at Volunteers of America, which is one of the largest nonprofit owners and managers of affordable housing in the country. Welcome to the virtual release of our new report, Strengthening Cultural Responsiveness in Intergenerational Programs, Passion, Purpose, and Planning to Drive Equitable Change. I read this and it, I can't say enough about it, but we'll be talking about it all throughout this webinar today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of all the lands we're on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, let's take a moment to recognize the importance of all the lands we call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations, to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples, their cultures, and their traditions of strong intergenerational connections. At Generations United, we believe wholeheartedly that all levels of society are so much stronger when we build and support connections between the generations. To be effective in our work, we are committed to using a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens that recognizes collective and individual cultures, values, norms, ages, lived experiences, and practices that offer opportunity and support for people of all ages. Now we've embarked on a journey to be deeply intentional around DEI issues and practices across the continuum of our work. We are so honored today to co-host this webinar with the RRF Foundation for Aging, which over the past two years has supported the development of our diverse intergenerational programs initiative. And we thank them. This work has focused on elevating and supporting intergenerational programs that are inclusive and culturally, racially, and ethnically diverse. It's been guided by a stellar advisory group, and the group includes intergenerational practitioners, professionals, and researchers from all over the country. Many of them are on this webinar today. In 2022, we surveyed the intergenerational field with the goal of capturing responses from diverse communities that may not have felt represented in previous definitions of intergenerational engagement. Let me say that again. Diverse communities that may not have felt represented in previous definitions of intergenerational engagement. This is important. We received 189 responses from programs across the country engaging all ages from babies to college students and 50 somethings to people that are over hundred. The data was analyzed by Dr. Ernest Gonzalez and his colleagues at the NYU Center for Health and Aging Innovation and served as the foundation for this report that we are discussing today. Now, while we try to be intentional in addressing diversity in all of our work, the report, Strengthening Cultural Responsiveness in Intergenerational Programs, Passion, Purpose, and Planning to Drive Equitable Change is the first report we have looked exclusively at DEI issues and practices in intergenerational programs. This is the first focused only on diversity and equity. In the grand family space, we published racial equity toolkits designed to give resources and tips to child welfare agencies, other government agencies, 
and nonprofit organizations, including faith-based organizations, so they can better serve all grand families. Before I turn the program over to our co-host, I want to alert you to a couple of items. One, we are recording this webinar, and everyone who has registered will get a link to the recording of this webinar. So please feel free to share this link with other people. You know other people who need and want the link to this webinar. And you may have already noticed Generations United are posting links to relevant resources in the chat. So keep an eye on the chat box. Now, I am so happy to be able to introduce and welcome our co-host for today, Serena Worthington. Serena is Director of Diversity and Inclusion and a Program Officer at RRF Foundation of, for Aging. In this role at RRF Foundation for Aging, she engages with a diverse group of community-based and advocacy organizations, academic institutions, public policy groups, other foundations, and philanthropic partners. She co-leads the foundation's strategic priority area of social and intergenerational connectedness, which includes working with grantee partners focused on reducing isolation and loneliness in later life through efforts that strengthen meaningful social bonds, including those that span generations. We greatly appreciate Serena. She's joining us today, and we also appreciate, deeply appreciate the support RRF has provided over the years. So much of the work we have done, we've been able to do because of the grant and because of Serena. Thank you, Jatrice. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Generations United for inviting me to join you today. My name is Serena Worthington. I use she and her pronouns, and it's a pleasure to be here. RF Foundation for Aging is a grant-making organization with an enduring commitment to older people. For 45 years, RF is, has been one of the nation's few foundations focused on improving the lives of older adults, and we are the nation's first private foundation to do so. In addition to the social and intergenerational connectedness area that Jatrice mentioned, we also focus on caregiving, safe and affordable housing, and economic security in later life. Our funding strategies to increase social connection include building on existing programs and services, using technology as a tool for connection, promoting meaningful engagement, and creating social bonds across generations. RF is particularly interested in supporting the development of new assessment tools, broadening or sharpening existing ones, and backing their dissemination and implementation, today's event being a wonderful example. For too long, people of color and marginalized communities have been underrepresented in the intergenerational space. That isn't to say these communities weren't practicing intergenerational engagement. Many communities of color have traditions of bringing together younger and older people in meaningful and purposeful ways that are often based around the transmission of culture and care of elders and are ingrained in their practices and beliefs. This intergenerational engagement goes beyond being intentional. It is woven into the fabric of the communities that practice them. In addition to recognizing the diversity of experience when it comes to connecting young and old, Formal programming also needs to make space for a multitude of languages, ethnicities, and identities. We are pleased to have been able to support Generations United in celebrating and expanding the diversity of the intergenerational programming field. This survey and report are important steps in identifying successful DEI practices in intergenerational programs and the challenges we still face. It is my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Christy Guillory Reed. Christy is an independent consultant with over 20 years of experience and success in policy research and design, program management, stakeholder engagement, strategic planning, and communications. 
She has assisted organizations with bolstering diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts to foster inclusivity, building more diverse teams, and promoting DEI as a strategic business priority. She's also the author of the report. Welcome, Christy. Thank you, Serena. And I would like to say how happy I am to serve as a member of this panel today and say it was an absolute pre pleasure partnering with Generations United on this first of its kind report on strengthening culturally responsive programs. And I'd like to start, before we get into the meat of the report, I'd like to provide some background. And one of the first issues I'd like to discuss is why did we center race in this report? And as you'll see, there are three main reasons, but I'd like to give some additional context to each of these. And while there are many aspects of diversity, you'll see that race is something that is common to all of us. It underpins the experiences of all people. By starting with race, this gives us an opportunity to explore all of the nuances of identity. In addition, we all have seen numerous events, particularly around 2020, that have placed a much needed spotlight on the negative impacts of systemic racism. Several years ago, with the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, this also highlighted the net negative impacts of systemic and structural racism. Hate crimes have been on the rise for the Asian American and LGBTQ plus communities as well. COVID-19 further exacerbated the negative effects of racism by exposing the issues related to the unequal access of quality healthcare for marginalized groups. And third, Carefully designed, culturally responsive intergenerational programs value diversity. They understand differences, recognize biases, and develop supports to meet the unique needs of individuals and communities. Next slide, please. I'd also like to talk about the goals aims and methodology that went into writing this report. The goal was simple. We wanted to identify and elevate, and also I would like to add celebrate the programs that are actively uplifting and elevating culturally responsive practices. This report is a way for these programs to be lauded, but also for those that or seeking to do this work serve as a blueprint, blueprint for future work in this field. In terms of the aims, we'd like for this report to serve as a launch pad, a catalyst for change, for, and also a resource to guide the journey of other programs and services that seek to elevate culturally responsive programming. The methodology. In terms of writing the report, four intergenerational programs were interviewed. Their selection was based on a current review of Generations United programs of merit, programs of distinction, and other programs that are recognized by Generations United. And we we're so happy today that several representatives from some of these programs will serve as panelists. In terms of a review of intergenerational programs, in total, over 50 programs were reviewed during this process. I also felt it was important to interview staff at, Generation, at Generations United to find out what are they doing to uplift and prioritize organizational diversity. And there were also content review. I reviewed materials from webinars, additional program profiles and other research that went into the writing of this report. And now I'd like to get into the five recommendations that are offered in the report. Next slide, please. Recommendation number one, cultural inclusivity is a journey. And I can't underscore this point enough. 
Organizations that have prioritized culturally responsive practices view this work as ongoing. There is no time stamp that says we're done or halfway done, but it's something that is part of the organization's DNA. It's part of the organization's overall belief system. Organizations that undertake this work need to realize it will take time, but it also should permeate the organization's identity, beliefs, and values. They should be willing to ask, who are we and who do we want to be? One organization that we interviewed uh, it's called the Gaithersburg Beloved Community Initiative, said that they are all they are using these questions in order to propel this work. In meetings, it's constant examinations of who who is who do, who do we represent? Who do we want to be? Who do we want to be in the community? This kind of reiteration of these questions helps organizations to sift through these thorny issues. And again, this type of work needs to be revisited, updated, and discussed frequently. Next slide, please. Recommendation number two, the importance of intentionality and accountability. Be intentional, specific, and targeted about uplifting diversity. All levels of the organization need to be held accountable to truly make this a team effort. Intentionality and accountability work hand in hand in this process. How is intentionality achieved? Intentionality is achieved when it is placed at the forefront of the organization's efforts. When these efforts are prioritized, this sends a powerful message both internally and externally, that the organization is willing to hold itself accountable to achieve its goals. How is accountability achieved? This can be achieved through various means. Organizations can develop processes, metrics, and internal committees tasked with achieving inclusivity goals. For example, organizations can establish a commitment to recruiting a certain amount of diverse volunteers and program participants. But another important way that accountability can be achieved is when organizations are truly willing to have the difficult conversations on race and racism. Program leaders and staff have to hold themselves accountable and can't shy away from having these difficult conversations. Next slide, please. Recommendation number three, allyship and collaboration. Be proactive in seeking out allies and collaborators who bring a fresh and diverse perspective to your program and can serve as program ambassadors. Unlocking the power of allyship is essential to, to driving progress in culturally responsive programming. Allies can assist you in the fight against inequity through programmatic support, but also in their public acts of sponsorship of your program and its goals. But you must be proactive in these efforts. Allyship provides individuals with an opportunity to not only learn about the trauma that marginalized groups have experienced, but also to learn about the historical contributions of these individuals. It's not always negative information that allies learn, but also we'd like to shine a light on the positive. Collaborators can often be found right in your own backyard, right in your own communities. But the key to building truly positive relationships is to look at these relationships as authentic. I'd like to provide an example that really stuck out to me during the writing of this report of allyship. We encountered a program called the Stories of Atlantic City, which is an intergenerational program. 
and there was a young white ally that was a very active participant in this program. And when she was asked why she chose to participate in this program, she said that it was a quote, conscious, consciousness raising moment. This program had a focus on civil rights and storytelling. But through this, per, through her participation, this young ally learned about all the contributions that people, many people before her who were part of the civil rights movement, what they experienced. But for her, it allowed her to place her current work in the Black Lives Movement in perspective. It gave her much more perspective than the present. She was able to look at the past. And without being able to have these true authentic conversations, this young woman may have missed out on this wonderful opportunity where both the, both participants on the young participants and the elders were able to have a great symbiotic relationship. Next slide, please. Recommendation number four, diverse intergenerational programs as agents of change. Equip participants in diverse intergenerational programs with the tools to enact change in their communities. There are various benefits of intergenerational programs. Decreased social isolation for the elderly, a greater sense of belonging. For children, they can in in experience increased academic performance as well as healthier family dynamics. But in addition to these benefits, participants in diverse intergenerational programs can also be change makers in their own communities, but they need the tools in, to, in, in order to enact change in their communities. And these tools can be provided in a variety of ways through direct program participation, but also indirectly through just the normal going about of these programs, through normal conversations that happen. We encountered a number of programs that are equipping both the youth and the elderly to be powerful change agents in their communities. I would like to highlight an example. The Alliance for African-American Health in Central Texas. This program focuses on gardening, helping the youth plant gardens with the elderly. And along this, and along the process of this program, the organizers observed that in addition to just learning about the mechanics of gardening and placing gardening in the historical context of the African-American community, participants learned about food sovereignty, economic justice, and other types of ways that they could be change agents because it, it blossomed from just gardening. It became so much more than just the initial topic at hand. And we encourage organizations to think broadly as they are lift, uplifting culturally responsive programming that you may start out with one focus, but it can grow to so many other things as your participants become true change makers in their communities. Next slide, please. Recommendation number five, diversify your DEI approach. Be creative around DEI practices. Creativity and flexibility are instrumental in the implementation of organizational DEI practices and protocols. And I would like to underscore creativity and flexibility in these efforts. We urge individuals to think beyond the basics of DEI. Many people hear DEI and they think of typical topics involved in DEI training, microaggressions, anti-racist training, all of these things that, that typically come to mind. But we'd like you to this report, we'd like you to think a little bit broader than that and provide opportunities for staff and volunteers to not only grow personally, but to also equip them with the knowledge that can help them to build and deepen community connections. 
there are several DEI practices that organizations can implement. One, demographic research. I cannot underscore how important research can be in these efforts. Research can help to alert organizations to trends that, it, that they may not be aware of, particularly demographic research in terms of the trends of who is in your community? What are the What is the racial and ethnic makeup of your community? This can help you to maybe tailor your partnership and outreach efforts. The second, the establishment of internal DEI committees. This can help with organizational goal setting as well as accountability. The, again, harkening back to something I previously said, a, a committee and accountability. And accountability, if you want to establish metrics and processes, this internal committee can assist with these efforts. The third, restorative practices. And this is a helpful type of conflict resolution technique. And we've seen and we came across this and during our interviews and one of our panelists, this organization, the Home Organization Chicago utilizes this technique where issues are discussed openly and honestly. And again, these have to be safe spaces for individuals to talk about the issues that they are encountering and, all, and also ways of resolving conflict. Fourth, use of case studies and scenarios. These can help staff and participants to apply what they've learned. This brings all of the topics a more realistic approach when someone is presented with a case study or a scenario, when they're looking to examine culturally responsive practices. And fifth, asking critical questions. As you are designing programs that seek to uplift diversity, critical questions can include who benefits the most from this program? An additional question, what are the cultural assumptions that are informing our recruitment and retention efforts? Be willing to ask these difficult questions. Next slide, please. In addition to the five recommendations that are in the report, also wanted to highlight the challenges that we've seen organizations encounter, organizations that are prioritizing culturally responsive practices because we thought it was important to not only provide a blueprint for organizations that want to go down this path, but also to be realistic and what challenges you, you may encounter. And one of them is staff and participant pushback. Many staff may say, why do we have to undergo, undergo training? Why do we have to discuss these issues? Because these may be issues that they are not comfortable speaking about, or issues that they just may not have experience in speaking in speaking of. But you must realize these, these issues are gonna be difficult and often uncomfortable to discuss, but they must be explored. The road to inclusivity isn't easy or quick, but these organizations should be brave spaces and provide opportunities for staff, at all levels, as well as program participants, allow them room to grow. Second challenge, obtaining participant and community buy-in. We observed that the recruit, the excuse me, the retention of diverse participants in programs can often be an issue. But one way to possibly circumvent this challenge is when organizations, as they are considering developing and implementing culturally responsive programs, these plans should be co-created and shared with community partners. Inclusive programs should not be placed in communities, but should be part of the fabric of the community. It's really thinking about doing the, the prep work. Do the work before you implement a plan and engage as many community partners, as many diverse types of partners as possible. So people really feel that they had a say in how you implement these programs. And last, implementing, excuse me, incorporating diversity in a diverse community. As we were doing the research that went into this report, I noticed that there are programs that are uplifting diversity, but are already located in a diverse community, 
which presented a conundrum. How do you go about implementing diversity in a diverse community? But again, the staff and volunteers should resemble the community in every way, ranging from race, ethnicity, age, ability, sexual orientation, gender, and gender identity. But also the board. The board of directors should also reflect the community in various ways. So even though your program may be in an extremely diverse community, take a step back and think about are there any other ways your program, your organization can reflect all of the diversity that exists in your community? And as I wrap up, I would just like to say, next slide, please, that the time is ripe for organizations to examine, uplift, and to celebrate culturally responsive intergenerational programming to help address and combat systemic racism. We hope that these recommendations serve as a true call to action for those that aspire to do this work, but also for organizations who want to learn more and do more. And we hope that you can serve as an agent of change in your community. We would like to hear from you about the successes and challenges that you have experienced and also what types of resources would help you in your intergenerational DEI work. And I, we would like, I couldn't, I can't end without saying that we, that we would love to direct you to the report. The report contains much more information about the programs that I referenced here in in-depth program analysis, as well as additional data. So we hope that everyone will be able to read the report. And again, we want to hear from you and how we can continue this work and what resources and systems would be helpful for you. Thanks again. Well, Christy, thank you so much for that overview. As I said, I read the report and I loved it. It was easy to read, it was clear, it was digestible, and the call to action is something that I think we can all pay attention to and participate in the call to action. This report was based on interviews with a lot of intergenerational practitioners and I almost feel like I'm introducing celebrities because I've read about these people, I've heard about these people and the incredible work that they are doing around the country. Two of our panelists were interviewed as part of the report. They were selected based on their focus on diversity and as recipients of Generations United's program of distinction and program of merit designations. Our annual recognition of programs that demonstrate a commitment to high quality intergenerational practices. Now, Tony Collins, Tony Collins is the executive director of the Tuskegee Institute High School Class of 74 Read to Me program in Macon County, Alabama. And you should look up Tuskegee and Tuskegee Airmen to be culturally aware of the significance of Tuskegee. Nikki Mustafa is the housing director of HOME in Chicago. And Nikki, I've heard so much about you and HOME. I can't wait to hear you. Although Genevieve Layton Amar was not interviewed in the report, she was so impressive at the Generations United International Conference that the team was so inspired by her work, they invited her. They said she has to be on this panel. Genevieve is the executive director of Bay Area Black Leaders and Co-Generate Innovation Fellow. So with that, I'd like for each one of you on the panel to briefly share an overview of your intergenerational work. Tell everybody what is it that you do? And don't forget to be brief. Thank you. 
we will start with Tony from Macon, Alabama, class of 74. Good evening, good afternoon. Uh, Tony Collins from Read to Me program, uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, Macon County, uh, to be specific. Uh, the Read to Me program was established by the class of 74 uh, in an effort to uh, leave a legacy of service uh, to the community that love. Uh, born and raised in Tuskegee, born on the campus of Tuskegee Institute uh, in collaboration with Tuskegee University. Uh, we've been attempted to reach our children between the ages of uh, six months to five years to ensure that they can read by the time they're six years old. And so we understand that how important that is. Uh, and that's our initiative, uh, leave a legacy of service, leave a legacy of future for our children uh, in the city of Tuskegee, where we dearly love. Excellent. Nikki Mustafa. Hi, uh, I work at Home Housing Opportunities and Maintenance for the Elderly. It's a long name, I know. We have three intergenerational buildings for older adults and young people and families with small children. Um, we also have a moving program that moves people with a lower income all over Chicago. We have a shopping bus program that works in areas with not very good access to healthy groceries to get people their groceries and help them get them back to their apartments. And we also have a home repair program that helps people free of charge, fix things in their homes. And once once our repair guys get in there, their home is looking good as new. So that's our elevator pitch. Thank you, Nikki. Genevieve. Hello everyone, I'm Genevieve. Um, I started Bay Area Black Leaders, also known as Babel, um, from a place of my own burnout, um, working in a capitalistic society um, in the nonprofit sector for over 15 years. Um, I found myself really burnt out at the beginning of the pandemic and worked with a lot of other Black leaders in trauma-informed spaces at the Public Defender's Office, um, other nonprofits and arts and uh, different sectors in our community and realize a lot of Black leaders are burnt out and we need to find ways to rest and rejuvenate. Um, we are the home of the Black Panthers and tapped into some of the practices they had and uplifted um, how we can hold each other accountable to rest and to continue that process to share with others. Well, thank you. You all certainly do follow directions well. You're <laughs> right on time. I'm going to give you some more time later on. Thank you. Um, Tony. Yes. Macon County, the home of Tuskegee University, has some staggeringly low literacy rates. How did you and your classmates in 1974 come up with this idea? Your classmates from 1974 come up with this idea to start putting pieces together to help address this very critical need in your hometown? I think our experiences reflected uh, that we needed to go back to our city and do something good. Uh, and that uh, the best thing to do is to help our children. And so we have, uh, again, born on the campus of Tuskegee Institute, we have a strong affection. And we understand that Tuskegee is about reading. For black folks uh, in, 19, in 1881, and uh, when I was growing up, it was Tuskegee was the spot. And so we understand that we have a long legacy of reading and, and teaching folks how to read. So why not our kids? Why aren't our kids reading at a level that they should be reading at? So uh, we were very adamant about doing something very positive uh, and, and very soon in our neighborhood to increase the, the opportunities for our children and increase the future of Tuskegee. Thank you. That's amazing. Nikki? Your work supports intergenerational housing. Home has done so much intentional work to create an inclusive and safe space for everyone. On your website, you have very strong, very strong equal opportunity statement, as well as your SAGE Care Platinum credential. And SAGE is so important because so many people who've spent their life in the closet finally came out, finally got married, now have to go back into the silver closet because of some of the unfair practices. And Nikki, you are working on that. Talk to us about your work, Nikki. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it's so important to, to allow everyone that works in our building and lives in our buildings to live their life safely and freely. Um, you know, we want everyone to be able to live their truth. I've seen so many older adults that have lived their lives for someone else and they're deciding, you know what, this is my time. I'm really just going to live how I how I feel that I should live. Um, and we want them to, to be able to feel safe and open to do that. Um, we work, we, we try to have representation in everything. We try to represent every demographic that is in our building. We try to make people feel that they, they are being seen and heard and valued. Um, we always lead with re respect for every person. Um, yeah, we're trying, we're trying to fix some stuff. Yeah. You've got some stuff to fix, Nikki. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> this is wonderful what you're doing. <laughs> wonderful what you're doing. Genevieve, I love that your work focuses on restorative rest and reflection. It's so important for people who do challenging work every day. It's exhausting. They need to find time and space to recharge their batteries. I told you the story about an acting college president who was a black woman who died on stage. People said a short prayer and they resume the program. I'm still in pain over that. And I think that it speaks to how those of you who work in this kind of challenging work, intergenerational work, are sometimes exhausted but expected to keep carrying the load by yourself without adequate help. So Genevieve, what can you talk to us about that refers to finding the space to take care of yourself as leaders, as practitioners? Oh, well, I think I just need to take a breath and a moment too from everything you've just mentioned, but um, the biggest thing is, is rest as empowerment. You know, rest is not just a luxury, it's a transformative tool. Um, by providing a safe haven for Black leaders to rest and rejuvenate, we empower them to continue their vital work with renewed vigor and clarity. Um, community strengthening, our initiatives foster connections and friendships amongst leaders from all generations. Uh, these connections strengthen our communities, uh, create supportive networks, have accountability around rest, um, we really focus on the, on sharing with folks that rest looks different for everyone. Um, and when we first think of rest, we think of taking a nap or sleeping. And when we're working in these sectors, that's really hard for us to um, come to terms with taking a moment for ourselves. But um, we can't. It's the idea we can't pour from an empty cup. And and I love for even past that for folks to pour from their overflow. Um, you know, because you deserve that cup first. So. These connections like strengthen our communities, as I mentioned, create a supportive network and amplify the impact of the collective efforts. Um, back to this accessibility self-care model. Through our work, we demonstrate that self-care isn't a privilege, but a necessity. Um, we showcase accessibility, uh, community-driven models that can be replicated and customized to fit various contexts, emphasizing the importance of culturally relevant approaches to rest. Um, and, and ideally, the goal is that this is something that's a learning for all. The lessons from our work extend beyond Black communities. They underline the universal significance of rest and self-care in sustaining our change efforts. Um, it's about creating spaces for everyone to pause, reflect, and find strength um, intergenerationally and share that amongst each other. Many of you listening on this webinar need to go to her website and learn more about how to take care of you along with your intergenerational partners. Now, Nikki, you uh, and many practitioners work with staff that come from different races or identities. Sometimes the participants are uh, predominantly people of color and younger and the practitioners are older and white. How do you make that work? How do you um, culturally prepare people to interact with each other when they have not interacted with each other before? 
Um, how do you get them to warm up to each other? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? That's very important. Where and how do you start? Yeah. So um, like I said before, we lead with respect above everything. Uh, that is what we we tell our our staff to do with all of our residents. We also remind people that every time they are coming into work, they are entering a person's home. And so they are to behave accordingly. Um, we use a lot of education. You mentioned our SAGE certification. Um, that is so important to us. We also um, do a lot of learning seminars. We just met with some um, of these really generous indigenous women in Illinois that are helping us to learn more about the importance of land acknowledgements and what they look like and how to better educate ourselves on those so that you know we as an organization can do better um, the more we learn. And then we also remember that there's no one type of way to be diverse, right? Like diversity comes in so many different forms. There's body diversity, there's racial diversity, there's cultural diversity, there's diversity in our gender and the people that we love. There's, there's all different ways of being diverse. And so we like to celebrate and acknowledge that everyone comes with their own type of different and we want to learn about what makes you different and let's celebrate those things. Um, it's, I, we just try we just try to be nice to everybody. I <laughs> Nikki, that, is more, that is more important than you think that's, everybody. That's Don't really, underestimate what really being more, nice can be. Yeah, that's really yes. what we tell our staff yeah. when when they're feeling overwhelmed with like, you know, what do I do? There's all these different things and cultural holidays coming up and what do I do? And we say, let's just like be nice to everyone and let's let's make it so the kids in our building that might look differently from us, let's make it so that they see people that look like them. Absolutely. Now, Tony, you have an interesting uh, space where you have diversity within diversity. The people right. who are mentoring, the people who are teaching come from different culture, different uh, economic background and still have some misunderstanding, some things to learn just because the same skin color doesn't mean that everyone is the same. Can you talk to us about how you prepare people for that and how you help people navigate those differences? Well, I, I think for us, it's just a matter of trying to share uh, those kinds of folks with the uh, young folk so they can see, uh, you know, uh, we have to see things. Uh, and, and so we try to present before them an, an audience of, of that, just diverse individuals from different places, different colors, uh, different uh, classes, uh, which is huge to our children. And so uh, when they see that, they, 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 I think they gravitate that to towards that uh, and they're very, get, get very comfortable in that. So that's very important to us is that we share with them as many people as we possibly can to see that there's this place outside of Tuskegee. There's a lot more places to go, a lot more places to see uh, and reading and understanding that those folks are, are willing to, to, to bring those folks in and to share with them is so important to us. So much of what uh, young people need is exposure and motivation. There's a saying that if you can see it, you can be it. Yes. So I really appreciate the emphasis you have on exposing young people to other opportunities early on. Great. Very early on. That, that's the important part, right? Early on. Uh, yeah. So Genevieve, um, what can leaders of all ages and colors learn from your work? You focus on black leaders, but let's talk about everybody because burnout, depression, hurt, we see so much and we have so few places to talk about it, to feel it. Share with us what your program does that is universal. Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing we do is try to start with unconditional love. Um, you know, uh, Nikki had mentioned like at the basis of everything uh, home is doing is they're trying to be kind. And I, and I think we sometimes overcomplicate a lot of different issues and, and something that 
we really try to get back to is how do we show ourselves unconditional love so therefore we can share that with others. Um, and sometimes that does mean pausing, taking a break, slowing down, being more mindful in the way that we move and operate, um, checking in with ourselves. You know, it's a, a overused term that I don't think we really sit with often of, of learning to be a friend to yourself or stopping to smell the flowers. Um, I, I, those things that we apply to our personal life, I think once they're modeled in your workplace of um, even taking a sick day before you're extremely sick um, allows you to kind of... Uh, understand how you can show up better in your workplace. The goal of uh, what Bay Area Black Leaders is, is promoting is, is rest so you can show up intentionally and, and with more clarity into the work that you're doing in the community and with others. Um, and that's across the board. We work with uh, young Black leaders as, as young as 16 to Black leaders that are 100. Um, and there's all different ways that elders are learning from youngers and youngers are learning from elders. Um, about how to approach this with your own personal journey of rest and how you can like communicate, model, and share that with others. Um, you know, so at Generations about, United, about generational storytelling as well. Storytelling, and, storytelling, yes. really important. At Generations United, we believe that intentionally focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion uplifts and impacts all aspects of your organization. So, can you? Uh, Talk to us about somehow diversity, equity, and inclusion has impacted your work in a positive way. Anybody have an example? Um, I, I think it's just allowed me to show up as myself. You know, I, I'm finding value in my culture and my background, and bringing that into my workspace has been a, a pride for me. It's a nice way to um, uplift and recognize that you already have a lot within you. Um, one of the things I came to realize through the fellowship at Cogenerate is cogeneration is in our blood, um, you know, and, and I think being able to celebrate diversity and inclusion and equity allows you to bring um, some of yourself to the table. And I think I was able to come to that realization because of a, a space of rest and reflection and mindfulness. I'm going to ask each one of you this. I'm going to start with you, Tony. Can you name one thing that you've done that has been successful in building connections between older and younger people? One thing. I think the one, uh, we started this program, uh, Read to Me, of course, uh, but we started people reading uh, through, uh, for the pandemic, we couldn't go out to the schools. So using Zoom, we've introduced a lot of children to different, a lot of different people. We had some actors from LA, uh, when I read to our kids. So we've exposed the kids to a lot of different folks through this medium called Zoom uh, that we thought would be bad when we started because we couldn't go into the home room. But again, Zoom has been a blessing and we've shared more, been more diverse, been able to share more diversity with our children because of Zoom and the mechanism uh, that this shows us. But that has been a, a great thing. Uh, a well, lot of folks, yes. Yes, that's, that's important. Thank you, Tony. Yes. yes. Nikki, what about you? One thing. One thing, my goodness. Um, anything where we get to uh, do something, share something we really care about. So we've started doing crafternoons where someone shows up with a secret talent that's something they know how to make. Um, and they teach um, all the rest of us how to do it. And it's a really great activity for older adults and younger adults and everyone in between to take part in and learn something new. And I think any anytime we get to experience something, um, it just kind of brings everybody together. We're all, we're all the same. I like that. Crafternoon, crafternoon. I like that, Nikki. Very creative. So Genevieve, one thing. Yeah, Jesus, do you mind repeating the whole question? One thing. Yes. What is one thing you've done that has been successful in building connections between older and younger people? Oh, I think um, empathy and being vulnerable has allowed us to really create innovative ways of what rest looks like um, in this generation and something that we can bring into the future. So I, I think um, allowing space for people to connect, um, understanding that that takes time, being patient um, with that rapport building, 
um, ha has strengthened the way that we build communities and hold each other accountable to uh, slowing down and living more with peace. We're almost at the end, but is there anything anybody would like to add? Anybody from the panel? You guys are superstars, rock stars. You're talking to a whole bunch of people. Anything to share? I think this is really, when we're talking about DEI work, and implementing it every day, it can be really hard and it can it can look overwhelming and you don't know where to start, but just just do it. You'll you'll end up learning so much and it'll make your life so much better. Success starts in the womb. Say that again, Tony. Success starts in the womb. Okay. All right. Genevieve. Oh, um, I think with my first generation background, I always have different African proverbs. So I, I, I think the report is beautiful and like you mentioned, really digestible. Um, but I want to share with folks um, that are going to be utilizing it that take it piece by piece. You know, there's an old African saying of how do you eat an elephant? And the, the saying is piece by piece. Try not to take it all at once and oh, yes. implement everything, but, you know, incorporate what you can at different times and be be OK with yourself at the pace that you're going. So take it piece by piece. Don't get overwhelmed by everything because this is such a hard, huge issue of intergenerational diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely. Thank you so much, panelists. You have been clear, you have been concise, and you've given us so many good ideas. As I said, I felt like I was talking to celebrities and now I can see why you are celebrities. You are doing great things work. So I want to thank our panelists, Tony, Nikki, and Genevieve for being with us today. You can learn more about their programs in the report and links that staff have shared. Two of them are in the report, Nikki and Tony. Now there's one organization I have to mention that was in the report called Grandpa's United. I love that name, but even with that cute name, they are doing such incredible work. Look them up when you read the report, Grandpa's United. Another thing is I want to thank Christy Guillory Reed for authoring this report. And you did an incredible job, Christy. It was just so informative. And I love the appendix and the information you gave us in the back. So we created it as a starting point for you and for others in the intergenerational field to expand the space for ethnically and racially diverse programs, participants, and staff, and recognize and elevate existing intergenerational cultural practices. It's been an honor to co-host this important webinar along with the RRF Foundation for Aging. I wanna thank them one more time, Serena. Serena Worthington, thank you so much for acknowledging and supporting all of this incredible work. I'll accept on behalf of the team <laughs> and our board of trustees. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, we hope that you find inspiration from the richness of intergenerational programs that are making an impact in diverse communities across the country and the world. Uh, two things, in closing, I wanna make sure that you looked at the pictures because Generations United is always very intentional about how they portray people. I want to thank the staff of Generations United. They are incredible, always creative and fabulous to work with. Sherry, I'm looking at you. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Don't forget to rest and take care of yourself and read the report. Read the report, share the webinar, share the report. Goodbye.